Mike Bonner, and Mike is a new reporter with the New Bedford Standard Times. Good afternoon, Mike. Thanks for joining us. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me. Uh, Mike did a great story today. Uh, got a couple good stories in there, uh, but uh, he's got the uh, the Ward Three election and what's going on with that. And uh, it's an in-depth story. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, it's, they've got pictures of all the candidates. If you haven't met them, they've got the bios on them. They have their positions on a couple of issues as well as a, a story, and they take into account uh, some of, the, some of the area of people who follow the elections, myself included, in the article. And, and I, I appreciate you for, uh, for including me in that project, Mike. Uh, w- what are your thoughts so far on the election? Yeah, I, I think when you look at, I've been to the two well, forums, they call it, and then uh, I spoke with Wesley Sykes, our reporter. I wasn't able to go to the third forum because I was actually at the city council meeting. Uh, and it seems like it's a pretty close race in terms of beliefs. Uh, there's not a whole lot of disagreeing going on among the six candidates. And that's what I kind of told Wesley in the sense that when you go out there, if there's anything that there's disagreement about, that's what you're right about. But really, throughout it all, I think the main thing that I remember about the disagreement was uh, a sanctuary city and uh, the legalization of marijuana. And really, I'm not really sure how much those candidates would have when they actually get in the city council, what that means to them really there. So as we talked about on the phone, there's some national issues that get asked about these candidates. And really, it's more of a it's very much a local election. So sure. th- there wasn't much disagreement. I don't know if there's a lot of, oh, well, Hugh Dunn stands for this. And then Jill Usack stands for that. And Mark Sajak is here. It's more of uh, kind of a feel, I think, when you go out there. And we- we've talked about Hugh Dunn really, I think, separated himself in terms of advertising, but in terms of going out there in terms of his endorsement so to me and as we kind of said in the article as you mentioned he kind of seems like the guy that will at least be one of the two that moves on and then who moves on out of the final five is kind of a a toss-up I think it's very difficult to tell who comes out of out of the who is the other person who gets into this election and then why why they are and and then where do the other candidates go? Do they do they stick around? Because as we as we talked about here, Mike, this is we've got a preliminary election to fill a special seat for a period of time, just a, a, a small period of time. This is all going to be done again in in November. It'll be it'll be interesting to see, as you said, who who gets the votes. Because as I said, I don't know if any of them are really truly different characters uh, from what they believe in. And uh, when you look, I, I mean, you look from someone as experienced as a Kathy Denner or Mark Zajac who have served in the council. You can see why someone would vote for them. And then you have a Bethany Photo who has really no experience whatsoever. And I thought she had one of the uh, the first forum I was at. I was like, wow, she was really impressive because mm-hmm. she spoke from the heart. And she said, you know, I know these issues. I experienced these issues. I don't want to change the opiate crisis because I, I want to do that on my resume. I've experienced, I've been to funerals where my family members have have died because of opiates right. and that was really powerful to hear but then you get into her unpolished and sometimes uh she the stream of consciousness where she says some things where you're like oh okay uh so uh, it's really interesting because you can you can you know vote for a bethany photo because of that you can vote for a hugh dumb because of his endorsements you can vote for a uh, kathy denner because of her past she served as a war three right. counselor so she has that experience and then mark zajak is someone who uh was a city council president at one time and we've talked about uh um jill usack and the sense that she may be that that second person behind Hugh Dumb because she got a lot of publicity for not being vo- uh, invited to the Democratic uh, Forum, if you want to call it that, which that kind of backfired. And then from what I've talked about, some other people, they've really liked Guy Rock. So right. it's it's really it's so interesting. And as we've mentioned in the article, when you're talking about maybe 500 votes right. between six candidates, it's it's kind of it's it's totally up there. It's. And that's why I think it's such a fascinating, fascinating race. You point out something that, that, that I've commented on as well, which is that, uh, you know, Bethany is very passionate about yeah. the issues. And I, I think she will do better than suspected because of that. Uh, but then it gets down to the mechanics of elections. If you all these candidates, uh, with the exception, I think, of her and Guy, all have political, real serious political experience right. locally. Um They've all been elected, or in, in Hugh's case, he's worked, you know, for the governor. He worked for right uh, the congressman, so they they understand the mechanics of the election. He certainly 
understands it because he's advertising and he's raising a lot of money and he's collecting endorsements and uh, doing direct mail, doing door to door. But with the other candidates, because we haven't seen any spending from them, I checked this morning before I came in. I haven't seen any spending from them, really. Um, it's all about door to door, I think. And is there is there anybody we hear not doing door to door? Not that I know of. And I know yeah. Jill Husek joked that she said, you know, I still haven't lost any weight. <laughs> she, <laughs> she goes, you do all, all this door knocking and, you know, you think you get a, a benefit of it. But I think that's it. And I think in speaking with the candidates, that's what they really tried to to base their platform on. Even Hugh Dunn said, you know, in, in the cold weather, he was out there knocking on doors and he thinks it really made a difference because it's freezing outside, but he's still showing some commitment. And that's where I think they're even when you go to the debates, even when it's not you know, door to door, they were really trying to hit on their personality and who they are. Uh, Kathy Denner said many times, I, this is my city. I've lived here for right. 60 years. My heart is in this city. So you're still that there's no political forum there. There's not, Hey, this is what I stand for. It's, this is who I am. New Bedford is who I am. You're trying to make that emotional connection, which is really what you're trying to do door to door too, is make that emotional connection. Yeah. And really an embarrassment of riches because all qualified candidates, uh, really qualified, some of them are really exceptionally qualified candidates and experienced. And then what happens to them after they lose? Because there's only going to be one. And what happens to them? Did, does this spill over into um, a citywide election? Because, you know, no, they would never get this kind of publicity in the paper. This is a beautiful set, series of articles that you folks have there. And they wouldn't get the experience here, uh, uh, exposure here on the radio uh, with our news department or our talk side. Except for the fact that this is a special election. Um, one of the things, as you point out, it's an issueless election, appears to be anyway, at least at this point. I, that could change when we, get a, when we get to the final. The medical marijuana issue, which is really out there and right in Ward 3, uh, what are your thoughts? Have you seen that gravitate much? much? Yeah, it was, it was weird because the first forum, it was huge. It was kind of the main talking point, and then it kind of disappeared between the final two. So I don't know yet what happened. I think if you have uh, Jill Usack in the final, she was the only one who said that uh, she disagrees with all marijuana use. Uh, I, I think, well, definitely recreational. She said she agrees with, uh, will support the voters' wishes. Uh, but I know the big difference, I, I, I can't remember what she exactly said with medical marijuana, but I know she, she was the only one who balked at recreational marijuana too. And all the, rest, the other five candidates said, hey, whatever the voters want and, and that's fine. So that would be the big issue difference there, right? Um, in recreational use, uh, but yeah, you're right. It, it, even the issues, as I said, the whether it's building 19 or um, the the um, crime or anything like that, they all agree on those on those issues. So even if there are some issues in the election, the only one, as you kind of mentioned, where Jill differs from the rest are uh, the recreational use of marijuana. Which again, I'm not even sure h- how pertinent of an issue that is i'll tell you where it could be pertinent mike and this is new information to me it shouldn't have been but it is uh since we talked actually um for this article under the zone under the state law now that was passed which is subject to change by the legislature but i haven't seen them look to change this portion yet wherever there's a medical marijuana dispensary the city has to allow them to also sell recreational marijuana it's in the zone. It's in, it's in the, the law itself. It's Section 3 called local control. It talks about the ability to zone and ban, do these different restrictions. But right in there it says, however, if there's a medical facility, they have to be allowed to sell recreational. So this debate about medical marijuana versus recreational marijuana, at least as that dispensary stands now and the state law stands, that is also going to be a recreational dispensary, which I had no idea of, and, and it's my fault. I could have read the law. I just didn't. Um, <laughs> You know, I just or I didn't. I did read it before I voted for it. It just didn't jump out at me. But now that the mayor has signed the agreement, although the city has the city council hasn't ratified it, but I'm not sure that that's necessary. That is now going to be a recre that that will, unless state law has changed, be a recreational facility. And I think it was interesting what Hugh Dunn said uh, that uh, one of the points he made was he's not sure that they should have focused on a site in Ward Three without a councilor present there. And he said he would have really liked to have that decision made with a, a city, a th- Ward 3 councilor in there to kind of represent that voice of the, of the ward, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's a, that's a strong position and, and, a, and a smart one, too, because for, for, the, for folks who don't understand, where they're putting the medical dispensary, which will also be a recreational dispensary under state law, is right by Yestia Cycle, right on Hathaway Road, right off the highway. 
that's Ward 3. And when they signed the agreement, Ward 3 currently does not have a city council because Henry Bousquet resigned. He's out of there now. He's not part of the debates. And what Mr. Dunn is saying is, well, we should hold off on anything or should have held off on anything until the specific ward had a counselor. Yeah, and, and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I think he was the only one who really specifically brought up that point. Uh, the, the candidates weren't asked specifically about that, but he kind of you know, took a pause, made that statement first, and then answered his question, which I thought was, it, again, I thought it made a lot of sense because you're putting uh, what was the first forum, the biggest topic, you're, you're making something, a change in that realm without having the representation of that ward counselor. Yeah, that's a, uh, and that sort of bothered me. It's also the only precinct, no, the, correction, there's three precincts that voted no on recreational marijuana, and that just happens to be one of them. Oh, really? Yeah, it was only one vote. So, so <laughs> it really was only one vote. Uh, and I have talked to people in that neighborhood. Uh, they don't seem that concerned about it. Uh, however, I do, I know people who were selling a piece of property actually near there and said residential and they said they were they were glad to just be able to close on that deal because they were unsure of how it could affect their, I their remember, property value. Yeah, in the first debate, I think actually the the bigger debate around the debate of that was the traffic it's going to cause. That was actually it was more of traffic rather than and I think Jill kind of jumped in that too and saying, "Well, after the traffic, yeah, how are we going to make this kind of work around there? So it, it, it will be kind of interesting to see, especially as you said, moving forward is when it's narrowed down to two, how that conversation matures. Yeah, and I, I have gone out on a limb, I, I think here, I'm not on a limb with Hugh, I think it's, unless everything I know about politics is wrong, he's going to be one of the two candidates. But I, I suspect Jill has a real opportunity here because she does work hard, but she has the opportunity to get the Republican Party behind her. The governor has indicated he, he, he has endorsed her. But what that translates into in terms of money and manpower is yet to be seen. We haven't seen it materialize yet, right? Right. And I, I think I think the biggest boost she got was not being invited to the second debate. I think it just it worked out perfectly in her favor. And I mean, as a news organization, we had to reach out for her to get comment of what happened because you can't have all of the, the people talking without having her her voice in there and actually that was the lead of the story so right. i think it kind of backfired in a way for the the democratic uh whatever the party um but i i do i think she received a lot of support from bipartisan support from everybody because it's a nonpartisan election right it's uh so i i would probably put those two um but again when you're talking about so little so few votes it i mean 100 votes could swing everything which really isn't that much oh no uh, if if someone has a lot of relatives right, yeah. living there, and and they and and relatives who like them. Uh, that's important <laughs> too. Uh, they uh, they could win this thing just based on that. You know, being able to get your vote your vote out to the polls. Um, I haven't checked, so it's probably unfair to ask. But uh, I'm gonna anyway. Have you, do you have any sense on the absentee ballot? Balloting it? I don't know. That, that yeah. that's a good question, but I don't. I know. I know it extends through Monday too. So yeah, okay. You can. I think from what was it eight until noon on Monday, you can do it too. So it's still actually in the process. Yeah. That that'll be interesting if this if someone has an active, an active get out the vote campaign. I will say this: if whoever ends up facing Hugh Dunn, which is the, seems likely to us, they have to step up their fundraising. I mean, he's he's got about he raised about ten thousand dollars so far. And, he, and he's and he's using it uh, whether it's yeah pamphlets and and I know I've seen pamphlets from other candidates so I know that they're they're out there and, and such but yeah it it doesn't hurt him you know by any stretch of the imagination that he's that he has that and from the get go he seems uh, that he's just he's treating it as and I think as you told me very professionally he's right. treating it like a real election as if he was running for any other seat whether it's president or city council or whatever it may be that right. he's treating it very seriously yeah he's running a professional campaign mm -hmm. to the way the way you the way things are supposed to be done and it seems he's also sticking out because the others really aren't but they may not have to if they're really doing the door knocking and really uh, and really getting out there and talking to people it's a good point by you in the sense that maybe in November it's hands down him, but when there's no other, nothing else going on, they're all getting free publicity right. and they're all, their topics are heard in the standard times today. So people are now going to get to see what they stand for and who they are. I mean, if you go to our website, there's about a minute video of each person describing who they are. Oh, really? Maybe do we do that, you know, in November with 
school committee and everything else going on. Maybe not. So, yeah, I think it's a good point by you in the sense that because nothing else is happening, all of these candidates, it's it's as easy as a click as a button to see who they are, where in other in November, you may not know who they are, and you're just okay. I know who Dun- Hugh Dunn is. I'll go for him. Yeah, yeah. And there'll be there's a there's a blizzard of information, you know, during a normal election season. But th- these folks are getting getting a, a lot of free free coverage. Well, we'll take a quick break, and then we'll be back. We have Mike Bonner from the Standard Times here in the studio. Easy on the mimosas. This is Sunday brunch with Chris McCarthy on 1420 WBSM. And good afternoon. We're back, and I have Mike Bonner from the Standard Times uh, in the studio. And Mike, you could you can point out there there are no mimosas here in the studio, right? No, there aren't. And actually, it took him back to my time in Mississippi. They're they're all over the place in Mississippi. When I spent the last four years there, that's that's a big time uh, Sunday tradition down there. Mimosas. Yeah, yeah. You t- tell tell folks for a second. So let's give a little background on you, and then we'll get back to the to the local issues. You you just here at the Standard Times, right? Yeah, two months. Two months on uh, what are we? April sixth. I forget what month it was. It's flying by. <laughs> and where were you before that? Uh, I spent four years in Mississippi covering uh, Mississippi State for the Clarion Ledger. Excellent. And uh, but you're a Massachusetts guy originally. Yes, uh, I was born uh, and raised in Millbury, Massachusetts, which is right outside of Worcester. I think exits ten and eleven on the Mass Pike. Only town in Massachusetts that has two exits on the Mass Pike. Really? Town? Yeah, town. Oh, there are other cities, obviously, but town. That's an interesting fact. Yeah, a little fun fact for you. <laughs> fun fact: uh, If you folks are heading out to, to <laughs> Millbury yep. and you missed the first exit, don't worry. You're good. <laughs> There's another one. That's great. <laughs> That's great. That's great stuff, Mike. Um, so. You've uh, been covering the city now for a couple of months. Mm-hmm. What uh, what were your impressions of Liz Warren's? You have a story from Saturday about Liz Warren coming here with Ed Markey. What were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I went there not really knowing. Again, I uh, spent the last seven years covering sports uh, and a lot of sports news in, in, in that aspect, not just games and such. But I went there thinking not 100% sure what she was going to talk about, what she was going to be asked, because I'm thinking – the big topic was the the sea monuments out there that, right. that I have done a number of stories on them and, and such. I know that was something I wanted to ask her, uh, but also with the imminent, uh, that was supposed to be the imminent uh, vote, I thought on healthcare that she would may- maybe be asked about that as well. Well, the, the conversation certainly turned quickly as the, a lot of the, the news media was there from Boston to ask her about healthcare, and, and she basically talked, uh, she and... Senator Markey talked a lot about the health care, but there were bits and pieces from from the uh, the discussion on the port, which directly affects New Bedford more than anything. Right. Uh, so it, to me, it was it was interesting. Um, I know a lot of the this uh, seafood community was um, happy to hear that she and Senator Markey want to see more caution used regarding the the national sea mo- the marine monuments because it's it from my understanding and talking with ed washburn the director of the harbor development commission said the the crabbing industry is really what's affected by mm-hmm. those the marine monuments and uh J- mayor john mitchell went down to washington to talk about these monuments and how they're really affecting the, the industry uh and not so much that that he has a problem with the actual monuments themselves but the Antiquities Act that allowed President Obama to just kind of do it without as much research as the Magnuson Act forced other presidents to do. I think that was the issue, and that's where uh, Warren and Markey kind of agreed that maybe there should be some more research. The fishing community should definitely have a say when these type of monuments are are um, uh, established, I guess is the word. Yeah. Now, I guess they talked a lot about drudging, too, but to me, I was most interested in the Marine Monument because I know that was something that I had been kind of covering recently. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that uh, we're... The only person that can prevent to, to can roll back roll that back is President Trump. Yeah. And, and although I don't even know that he can do it, but if there's anybody that can do it, he can. So it's kind of ironic that we have to um, ask President Trump. Yeah, to I, help. I, in talking with some of the the sea against the seafood companies, uh, the seafood houses out there, I think they they really wanted to see Senator Warren kind of come out for that because she's a known you know liberal and mm-hmm. and to have that. That backing, she's a she's a powerful voice. Not only is she a liberal, but she's a powerful voice. They thought that would really help their campaign. That it's not necessarily liberal conservative. It's it's an actual non bipartisan, uh, a non partisan issue to to go out there because they are affecting um, you know the, the industry. Now there are some I spoke to a professor at UConn 
that said, you know, these are these are vital. They're overdue. So again, it's a conversation. I think both sides would say that. I don't think there's anyone in the fishing industry and, and John Mitchell agreed. This isn't an argument saying that there should be no protected land whatsoever. It's a conversation on let's have more of a conversation and get the fishing industries viewpoint on this and figure out how we can work together moving forward yeah i i, I get the same sense that you did for the mayor mitchell was disturbed by the process right he he said that the the under the antiquities act that this uh the marine monuments are forever and he said forever is a very long time now should they be protected we can talk about that but forever it, it just that he said i don't mean to sound you know Unintelligent, but forever is forever. It's a long right, time. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Forever is pretty permanent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, if you don't do something about it, it also creates the precedent that does the next person come in and, and expand it? Do they add something mm-hmm. to it? And can you? It seems un. It seems almost un-American, and I don't. I don't mean that in the Joe McCarthy sense, but to have allow the president to have that much power, it does. It seems that, our it's it's. The opposite of how our system's designed to work, where you have checks and balances, and to, to give the president that much power, uh, to regardless of party, it's, it seems. Un- and I think that's what John Mitchell kind of was honing in on. He didn't really have a problem with President Obama doing it. He didn't have a problem with that. He didn't think that it was outlandishly against his power. Mitchell was just saying maybe we should look at these acts, that specific act, the Antiquity Act, that allows them to do this, uh, because. He said it was it was established so long before any of the environmental acts that were established in the 70s and 80s that maybe we need to relook at that act. So I think Mitchell, for a lot, would agree with the sense of it, it, he disagrees specifically with the act rather than the people who are maybe you know making decisions about it. Right, right. Uh, so speaking of John Mitchell, uh, my prediction I've made it multiple times here uh, is that he run he runs again and he runs unopposed. Your thoughts? Oh, that's. That is way above my pay grade. Two months in, I, I wouldn't anything that I would say would not be very educated, which would be not very very good. I I, I can't disagree, but I can't necessarily agree with you because I just don't know enough about it yet. Yeah. Well, I here's the reasons I suspect he's running again. He's still raising money. So if he wasn't, he, yeah, that's a good. He point. doesn't strike me as a kind of guy who would raise money from people and then not run for the job. It just doesn't strike me as that kind of guy. There are those kinds of guys, but he doesn't strike me as that kind of it, guy. It was funny. We were what you were talking about the you know Elizabeth Warren and Ed Markey coming up. It, they were their entourage was walking through Sea Trade, and I was there as well. And I'm taking pictures on Twitter as such as now what a reporter does. And I'm not really paying attention to who else is coming. And someone hits me on the shoulder and says, "Hey, what's up?" And I'm like, "Who knows me from this entourage?" And it was Mayor Mitchell. Like, oh, okay, then he knows me and I know him. But right. I was just like, who? Who could possibly know me from these people? But it was kind of funny. Yeah, no, no. He's a very friendly guy, yeah. nice guy. Um, and really, look, he's, I, in my opinion, he, I could be doing a lot of other things. Uh, he's taking, a, I mean, with his resume and his experience, he's taking a dr- dramatic pay cut uh, being the mayor of New Bedford. He really is. I mean, he could be making probably a million dollars a year uh, in a law firm. So, uh, so it's weird that... that in some respects, you know, th- that he would do that, that he would, but he's got a, a, a big future ahead of him. I just don't see him uh, raising, as I said, raising money and then not running. Uh, and I also don't see anybody out there looking t- to, to run against him. Um, although we're going to have five political <laughs> political candidates who are looking for a job uh, after the sure. special election. So maybe one of those folks uh, comes out and takes him on. I, I, I don't know. We've given him a lot of free publicity. We have, and, uh, and if they're running for mayor, they're probably going to get more, even more pl- free publicity. They will get more free publicity. Uh, well, let's take a quick call here. Hey, good morning. Thank you for holding your live on WBSM. Hey, how are you today, Chris? Great, great, Larry. How are you doing? Good. I hear you guys talking about the monument, and um, the only problem with that is we're, we're using the fishermen, and the politicians are going to get on, on, on board. They like the idea because they're talking about a fisherman, but they're only talking about a handful of fishermen. So while they're discussing that, I don't know why they're not discussing for the draggers a little bit. This is this is big business that the that the government's working with, and this is what's wrong with the aspect, in my opinion, of uh, the way the fishing industry's gone, and that's why the wealth moves out of town. It's like having uh, uh, New Bedford, uh, United States, and all your money's in China. Same deal. These guys don't live in New Bedford. They don't spend much money in New Bedford. Uh, they're big, big companies, and they get every, they buy everything bulk. 
so there's not even room for startup companies. But, I mean, they're all good in a blend, but when you're just going to back one, then there's, there's a problem. There's small fluke boats that could be easily asking for a quota, uh, 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 you know, a little bit more quota. for. There's two men boats out there that go around the vineyard, and they have very small fluke qu- quotas. So as far as when they start saying the fishermen, I, uh, I think they're talking about uh, not the fishermen, but big business. Hey, thanks, Larry. La- Larry's uh, spent, uh, he's a regular caller here to the show, and I, I know him outside of the show, actually. Um, he spent a lot of time as a fisherman. He knows quite a bit about about the industry. There is discussion about that—the big boats versus the versus the small boats. There was, and there, I think there was just an article in the Boston Globe about that. Yeah, and it, and it's definitely a problem that will uh, you know be coming to New Bedford, uh, no question. I think the other point that Larry raises that was interesting um, is, and it w- it's what Warren and Marky actually said was, we're going to fight for the fishermen every single day, but that. At the end of the day, they, they can't change Washington in this sense. And what we were talking about, this this monument is a federal law. Signed, and as you said, we, is Trump the only one who can necessarily change that? So Warren and Markey can go out there and, and do all they want, but at some point in time, their power ends to the executive branch. So it, it is interesting in the sense that you can have it, it, the mayor went down to Washington. Uh, Warren and Markey both said, hey, we're, we're going to fight for you guys every single day. But at some point in time, it they need help from somewhere else. And I think that's maybe where Larry's point comes in because, yeah, it, it's there's only so much they can do before, especially when you're talking about the monument, that, that at some point it's kind of out of their jurisdiction. Yeah, and, and also the longer it sits there, I mean, I know that there's a, there's a grace period here where the crabbers can still operate mm-hmm. in the area. I think it was like four, seven years, was it? I yeah. It was. You know, and, but there's some guys that they ended immediately. Okay. Some guys they ended immediately. I probably shouldn't have delve into this too deep because I'm just a little unsure. But some guys, some part of the fishing industry, and of course, when we talk to fishing industry, is, again, as Larry points out, there's all kinds of right. different <laughs> aspects of it, all kinds of different seafood. Just go to the market, if right. you, you know, and take a look around. They're all caught in a lot of them are caught in different ways: traps, draggers, um, long lines. That's that's the extent of my knowledge right there. So. And well, it's very yeah, it's very nuanced. So you just can't go out there and argue for ground fishermen or, or scallopers or any, it, that, that. It's a good point. Yeah, there are the big boats, the small boats, or anything like that. It, it's it's very complicated issue, but it's 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 an issue that affects a lot of people. I mean, they they brought up a number of times during that meeting. Two percent of the of Massachusetts gross domestic product is from New Bedford, the port of New Bedford. So it's a big it's a big piece of the pie. Uh, but th- it's such there's so much into that piece of the pie. It's it's not just right. you know a, an apple pie or cherry pie. There's there's a lot of pies in that one little slice. <laughs> yeah, there's a it's a it's a seafood casserole, yeah, Mike. Yeah, is that was that the metaphor you were looking a better, for? Better, yeah. That that, that probably was better than the uh, the pie metaphor I went yeah, for. Yeah, seafood casserole. Um, a couple months you'll you'll have that down. Yeah, yeah exactly. Being here. Good morning. Thanks for holding. You're live in WBSM. Hi, how you doing this morning? Good to hear you in the new guy. Uh, the the Ward Three race. I I, I I'm taking a different take on it. I think the incumbent, uh, Ms. Dana, has an advantage here. I think her core supporters will be easier to garner uh, than the other folks. Uh, I think second place is where, where the race is going to be. Uh, as you know, Zajac, former ward counselor down here, he was very, very good. And he, he had a lot of integrity, so much so that the council appointed him to fill in Tom Hodgson's seat. So he, he's got some... Uh, uh, legs about him, and I know how he campaigns, and he's a hard campaign, and he could surprise some folks. Uh, as far as uh, uh, the lady uh, that gets shut out from the Democratic Party thing, I think you're right that that you know that she's going to get I don't know what to call it, maybe a sympathy vote for all that action by the Democratic committee, but that has a double-edged sword to it also uh, because it, it, it highlights her Republican. Uh, stature, and, and, and it, even though it's a nonpartisan race, there's still a lot of animosity out there. So I don't know how that one's going to play out. Uh, and, and the other two people, uh, the attorney, he was good on the radio, and so was the other lady. I forgot her name, but but she was also good and, and, and enthusiastic. So you got a uh, you know a slew of candidates here uh, vying for. I think you're right about 500 votes. And if you get 150, you could be the winner in, in, in terms of the primary. In terms of the final. Whole different ball game. That's where the money's going to count. I don't think it counts that much, except that uh, Mr. Dunn has to have it to uh, get his name out there. Uh, and I, I'm not sure that that's going to be the winner. Well, this is Tom Kennedy, Mike. He's a, he's a former Ward uh, 6 city council here in New Bedford. Uh, Mike. And, and former councilor at large. Oh, former councilor. All right. Well, well that's, good. that's good, Tom, because let me ask you this question. 
after this is over, there's going to be five losers. But they're not losers. As Mike and I have pointed out, they've gotten a tremendous amount of free publicity uh, here in the paper and on the radio. Uh, a guy, do, do you think any of them will then pivot maybe and look at running at large? Well, I don't know if it's going to be at large or maybe registered deeds. Yeah, that's another issue coming up, you know, when that election comes. So uh, certainly any time, and, and I appreciate the fact that anybody that runs for office is not a loser. You know, I think everybody in this city should run at least once just to get an idea of what it's about. Uh, so there are no losers. Uh, you may not have enough votes to win, but that doesn't make you a loser. Uh, and you're right there. Uh, in terms of catapulting this particular race into an at-large race, that's, that's, that's a long, long uh, stride to take. And, and it's a lot more consideration in, in terms of continuing at that point. I think all of these people are committed uh, to running in the ward, uh, let the chips fall where they may, and then any decision to run at-large is a completely different decision. Hey, thank you so much for your input, uh, Tom. Yeah, it, it, it is a um, well. That's a that's a very interesting perspective. He he said Kathy Daner. He thinks is is um, has got the leg up she's, here. She's won it before. Yeah, you know, she's done it before. Right. I, I mean, to go to the the you know the sports metaphor where I'm comfortable with it doing uh, the, I've covered before. If a guy's done it before, if you know it's happened, it, it, I mean, when you look at the Super Bowl last. This past Super Bowl, yeah, it was surprising when you look at the past result, but when you look at what Tom Brady's done in the past, well, hey, you know what? If there was one guy who could do it, it would be him. Well, Kathy Daner's won this seat yes. before. She's She knows what it takes to do it. So I think that certainly makes her a, a competitor. And it, as he mentioned, Mark Zajac was the city council president at one point. That that certainly uh, needs to be looked at as well. And, I, and we see the people who have experience politically, but those two, uh, Bethany Photo and Guy LaRock, when you hear them speak, as, as Tom pointed out, they're really passionate. Right. They really want to make a difference and help, which, uh, I mean, it can't hurt, and, and that might win some votes as well. So, yeah, it, it, it is pretty wide open. We don't want to kind of sound like we're on the fence, but if we, if we mention, if you had to pick, it looks just specifically how he's running and how much money he's put in and everything done may have an, a, an advantage, but that is far from meaning that he's, you know, looking forward to the April election. Right, because the—, the the uh, the universe is so small, right? And and it's it, and therefore ca- anything can can change it. Now, the, the, we haven't seen anything pop up in this election like, as often does that makes it that changes the dynamics of it. That could happen in the final election. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe when they maybe when they uh, they raise the building and start construction, if that happens um, in Ward Three with the marijuana, that could be an issue. That could get get people more energized or if whoever comes out of this thing whoever comes out of this thing and assuming they're facing Hugh Dunn um, is going to get a, a, a tremendous amount of publicity and scrutiny as well and then you're going to see whether they can they can raise the money I, I do think from listening to Guy Guy LaRock he's sort of the sleeper candidate in, in this in some ways I thought <clears throat> if he was raising more money I, I think he would he, he could have a real shot here because he, he is impressive he, he, he and he's very genuine. I got that sense where it, you know sometimes uh, some candidates would think that if you don't know something, it's it's a flaw. And he's very upfront. Says, you know what? I don't know the answer to that. I will find the answer for you, and I'm going to go try to figure it out. And and to me, that there's a genuine aspect to that. Where I mean, Bethany Photo's whole uh, campaign re- really is we need to change who's in there. There's a there's a there's a divide between the counselors and the. The rep- who they represent, mm-hmm. it's elite and not elite. That's that's maybe what she's running on. And if you were to put any, you know, water in that in that barrel, Guy LaRock really runs that in the sense that, hey, I'm an honest person. I'm right. here to help. And I, if I don't know your answer, I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to, you know, blow some smoke at you. I'm going to tell you who how it is. And, and that was refreshing when you hear him talk. And he and you can tell, he, uh, like they all do, but th- he genuinely cares about the ward. Yeah, no, he, he he's impressive, and he's, and he's got the education, and, uh, you know, as an attorney as well. We'll take a quick break. 1420 we'll right WBSM Sunday Brunch. And good afternoon. I'm Chris McCarthy. This is Sunday Brunch here on WBSM. If you'd like to join the conversation that I'm having here with uh, Mike Bonner of the Standard Times, you're welcome to at 508-996-0500. Um, you, before the break, you were talking about Bethany Fateau and her her haves versus the have-nots type of argument, the class argument, the disconnect between the voters and the leadership from her from her perspective. One of the demographics in that race is this, there's at least three uh, public housing projects in there. There's 
uh, Presidential Heights, there's Brick and Wood, uh, and there's, um, I think it's Shawmut Village, which is kind of over by the high school. Um, if she can get that vote out, you know, uh, what, what are underprivileged or, you know, people, that could help her. I, I, I was really moved by, uh, it was the first uh, debate or forum, and uh, her opening statement, it was it was pretty powerful because as she she's... She went in a lot of ways, you know, as embodying by running, embodying the American dream, so to speak, in the sense of she, she's cl- she's claiming, you know, she feels underrepresented. She feels that no one's listening to her. And uh, I think as one of, the, one of the callers said, you know, she's trying to make a difference. She's trying to go out there and instead of, you know, just saying what she's saying to a friend or a parent or someone, she's going out and trying to make a difference, trying to to change and, and be heard. Now, um, I think one of the I think it was the second debate it was um, where she was making the case of the the elites not listening to the the people I believe uh, Mark Zajac who who held uh, the city council president said well I, I'm not sure you know I think the councilors do try to listen to their constituency and stuff but yeah it it it, it goes back and forth but she she's extremely passionate about running right. and and I think it, again it goes to all of them as as one of the people I interviewed for the story. They said the Ward 3 is, is kind of in good hands because having six people wanting to run and all of them being as passionate as they are right. about helping people, that, that that's a good position to be in. Yeah, it, it, I've labeled it an embarrassment of riches. You have a lot of really experienced people and you have a blend of new people who are enthusiastic and experienced in, the, in their own ways. So no matter who wins this race... Um, I think that Ward Three, as you put it, is in good hands. I think that they're gonna, they're, they're going to do well. Uh, what it comes to, you know, if you if you're in that race, it's a tough decision. Uh, if you're voting in that election, it it is a tough decision because I think, you know, you've got a lot of people who are all ready to do the job on day one. Yeah, I think so. Uh, now I will say, and I think it's quoted in the article um, that I wrote that it for us uh, someone like Larock or or Photo, it might take. A little bit to just get used to right. the city council and such, where the others might hit the ground running just because they're they're a little more polished. But hey, you know what? If you think someone else is a better candidate, I mean, a- anyone can learn. And I think when you have the passion that they all have, once you're willing to learn, it's the, the learning curve's a lot easier. No, you're right about that. And it's also when you come from the outside, you're bringing a totally different perspective right. to things. So it it uh, it's going to be interesting. I, I'm dying. You know, it's all. Uh, I don't get too dramatic about this, but it's going to be really interesting election day. Yeah, well, now that, all that, that we've talked about it and you're writing stories about it, it you kind of now want to see what's going to happen. You right, know? <laughs> right. I mean, it's it's been for a while. I I, mean, I love the story because also what what comes next? We're going to have two candidates facing off. We, we I think we're we're comfortable saying Hugh Dunn is going to be one of them, but it might not be. Well, and when you have as many candidates as you have, uh, you don't know because if it was. If it was, you know, two people, you can kind of, okay, here's where, but with six, there's so many options that you just don't know how, where you're going to go. And and because there's so many options too. Do you go with, uh, you know, Kathy Denner, who, who has done it before? Do you go with the Mark Zajac, who, who uh, has been the city council president? Do you go with a Gila Rock who, again, has impressed when he's, when he's talked about it. And then we haven't even talked about Hugh Dunn yet, who, uh, seems to be kind of the front runner so to speak and we've talked a lot about bethany and, and then jill as well it, it you can find yourself especially when there's two spots going in two different ways right and also it's not a lot of issues there and where there are issues they pretty much agree right. except you know as you point out jill you is the only one who's totally opposed to the marijuana issue and while new bedford and that ward voted overwhelmingly for marijuana that was in a presidential election mm. this is a special city election totally different universe of voters yeah everyone who vote everyone who voted in the presidential election is going to vote in this race but most of the people that voted in the presidential election are not going to vote in this race and you know the interesting aspect too is uh kind of flipping that the other way is i think it was the one of the forums i went to i was asked at the end how many people lived in in ward three that were there and it was only about five or six but there were about 30 people there and they said well hey they're voting on citywide issues right so yes it it affects the people of ward three but there is also some interest from the entire city because they are they have a vote in the city council and that affects the entire city yeah and that's why i i suspect that um 
when when the other when the other the also rans at the end of the election, uh, unless they thought this was a totally miserable process, um, are all likely candidates to run again for something else. Yeah. Because they've received so much. Well, because it's, we, as we said, they're so passionate. It, it right. doesn't seem like you know you, you just you put in this work and this time, this campaigning, and then just kind of all right. Well, that was fun. Now I'll just go back to doing whatever. Right. You and you've worked so hard. Right. To get to get this name recognition and to meet all these people, and there's nobody who's in, who's done anything wrong in this election. Right. Every one of them has come out. Of course, we haven't looked either, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, we, will, we will wait till the final. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I think this is going to be very interesting election. I can't wait for it to happen. It's Tuesday, right? Yes. So if you live and in the, Ward the 3. the absentee voting is uh, Monday. It continues Monday. I think it began last week and it continues Monday as well. So that, that's something uh, we'll have to look at to see how many absentee votes, if there's anyone running an absentee voter program. I haven't heard of it, but yeah. a lot of things we, we don't hear about. Hey, good morning. Thanks for joining the program. You're live on WBSM. Hey, good morning. Since you're talking about elections... Uh, there's an interesting uh, potential election. Co- well, will be an election coming up uh, a year from September, and uh, in a district attorney's race. And I hear you uh, throwing about a couple of names, uh, such as uh, Mayor Mitchell and uh, possibly uh, uh, Representative Markey, who might be interested in that particular seat. What's your thought on that? I don't think the district attorney's race is up. Is it? Yes. Oh, that's interesting. I. My, I, my understanding is that. Uh, I think. It's a year from September is the actual election. So it's September of 18. Right. So that would be the primary for the district attorney's office. Okay. Jeez, I thought, I thought um, District Attorney Quinn was uh, – he was appointed by the governor. Mm-hmm. I thought he was elected to a four-year term uh, this past year. Uh, my, my I could be wrong. My understanding is that a year from September – and but whenever it comes up, I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there, and and uh, I see where uh, where where Quinn uh, talked to a couple of people. He's bringing in a whole bunch of people from outside the county into his office. It's entirely. I don't know what's going on. That's uh, that's interesting. You know, something we'll have to. Um, thank you for bringing that topic up. First of all, thanks for joining the program. We'll have to look into that. I, 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 I know at one at one point in time, I, I think that uh, when uh, who was it Tosada was in, um, and I know at one point in time, I think that uh, the mayor, when he uh, what was it, he was uh, a a prosecutor, a federal prosecutor. Correct. I think when he was interested in coming back to New Bedford, et cetera, that he was interested at that time in the DA's position, but. Um, but I guess he decided not to do that. So it'll be interesting to see, because Quinn doesn't seem to be very political uh, in, in that going out and, spe- you know, he's not tooting his own horn, so to speak. So it'll be interesting. I, I think it's going to be a real interesting, right? But what I've heard recently that a whole bunch of people, you might want to check into that, or get some opinion from different callers, but that a whole bunch of people uh, in his leadership team and also uh, just in his office in general um, are coming from Plymouth County. Huh. I, I, I hadn't heard that. I can check into that. I, uh, I have friends in that in that world. But I geez, I think that you're wrong on the election thing. But, but boy, it'd be great if you weren't, because I, I'd love to have another election to cover. We'll be right Sunday back. Sunday Brunch with Chris McCarthy. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining me here on Sunday Brunch. I'm Chris McCarthy, and we have Mike Bonner here for the remaining moments in the studio. Mike's... Uh, Two months or so in, in in at the Standard Times, a reporter, but he's got a, a long background in, it, including covering sports in Mississippi. Yeah, I actually, so I've been a journalist for seven years now, a oh, little more than seven. And uh, the first seven years of it was all sports, all uh, and all the way from Massachusetts to New York, uh, well, Central New York, upstate New York, Iowa, and Mississippi. And now I'm back home finally. <laughs> Any thoughts on the uh, on the NCAA tournament? You know, I, I didn't. I haven't filled out a bracket in a while, uh, just because I enjoy just. I, I I found myself rooting for my bracket rather than just enjoying the game. So right. I, I've just tried to enjoy the games. But I did pick a Final Four because, of course, everyone asks. Uh, and I picked Villanova. That didn't work out too well. Um, but Gonzaga and Kentucky. So Kentucky might still be there. Right. And I don't know who my fourth one. I might, maybe I said Kansas. I don't know. And they they. I didn't pick Oregon. I know that. So. Uh, maybe I got two out of the four, uh, and we'll see what goes. But I, I didn't pick a, a champion, but I did pick two, perhaps two of the final four. 
I just said I thought Notre Dame would win the whole thing, and we know how that worked out. So, <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm nowhere near alive in that. And hopefully, though, my predictions uh, in the Ward 3 election uh, will turn out better just simply because it matters more. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I could talk more about that than the, the NCAA tournament, so that kind of shows you yeah, where my where my pa- allegiances lie now, I guess. I, I, I do. I love the tournament, though, because the, the student-athletes, and in, most of them you're never going to see again. Right. You know, they're not going to the pros, most of them. Uh, and it's just really good. Good basketball, good sports, and, and you, it's hard not it's you hard not to root for both teams. And, you know what I mean? Yeah, because it, they're just good kids. And that's yeah, that's why I I stopped filling out the brackets because you just want to enjoy the games. Right. Because I'm rooting for you know my two seed to beat the ten seed, but it's fun to root for the ten seed. You know, right. so just throw my bracket out and I'll root for whoever I want in that because it, it is it's it's fun rooting for the kids and the stories. Right? Yeah, the absolutely. Um, I used a friend of mine who used to bet on sports and he said it ruined sports for him because he, <laughs> he now now rather than being a leisurely activity, it was something that he had that mattered to him. Well, yeah. Well, people always ask, is it difficult to cover sports? And it you're just. That you change instead of rooting for teams, you root for people. You root for stories. You root for a good coach rather than the jerk coach who never called you back. Or you root for the cool player who you know talked to you and gave you the time of day rather than just right. blowing you off and going to the locker room. So you just you, you root for stories rather than teams and people. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, Mike. Um, Mike, I want to thank you for joining us oh, of course, today. Anytime. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll try to get you in more often because um, you've got a great perspective on what's going on. And pick up the story today. Pick up the Standard Times today. And take a look at, or go online and check out his stories on Ward Three. Uh, on all the different candidates, and uh, you seem to be covering everything political now. <laughs> yeah, I'm all over the place. I you think are all over Joe place. Lopes said you just cover everything, and so that's just be in my card, cover of everything. <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, this has been Sunday brunch, and I want to appreciate uh, all of you folks who who sat home and listened, and those who who called. Um, we will be back here next Sunday, ten to one o'clock. Uh, I think we have Red Sox baseball coming up next after this. I don't know. I'm looking at one of the other people in the studio, and they don't know either. Um, I should have probably looked before I started talking about that. But hang around uh, here at WBSM, and um, I'll be back next weekend starting on Saturday with Ken Pittman, and then I'll be here on my own. Have a great day.